and I play all the way in shop and you, I guess we have really a card and ask ask the different the the different the Duchenen I guess can and can talk. Very pleased here today to be um, speaking to those who represent the different uh, Celtic nations and uh, Celtic tongues. Um, as a very long-standing um, colleague and friend of Peter Paris Fidelis, very pleased to be able to do this uh, small service for him. And I hope that um, I may be able to do justice to the address which he was to have uh, given you in person. On the Celtic Nations, 1961-2011, a sea change, question mark. It is an honour to be invited to address the Celtic League on this particular anniversary. I am aware that there are some who have a much better right than I have to give this talk about the half century of progress which has been made. But alas, with the death of Professor Cavdenes in July, I believe that uh, Seamus Fielding remains the only member of that first meeting in Wales in August uh, 1961. I think that uh, I shall have to take off my coat to this because uh, apart from the subject matter, uh, which probably will excite me as I read it and I you, I hope, uh, who hear it, um, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, good leaders of Falkirk for the heating in this establishment so close as we are to the refinery in Rangemouth. But uh, Peter says that it's an honour to be invited to address the Celtic and I'm very sure most of you will be aware that the history of the League and its campaigns and its many successes. Therefore, today I want to outline my personal journey with the League and whether I feel that these 50 years there has been a sea change for the Celtic nations. I joined what was the London branch of the League in late 64, when as a young journalist I just returned from Belfast, where I've been covering the general election for a London daily. I've remained in membership ever since. My entry to the League was through a meeting with the late Padre Paul Crahula. Padre was a great graduate of NUI Galway and had been a pan Celticist from the days of an initial head job, a monthly newspaper for Celtic peoples. Uh, Padre uh, went on uh, to, after the demise of that journal to edit the Celtic League's news sheet. Celtic News from 66 to 72 and was chairman of the League for nine years. It was Patrick who became my mentor on matters Celtic and I freely admit gave some order to my ideas which had formed earlier. My father was from Cork, my mother from an old English Sussex family, but her mother was from a Breton family who had sought refuge in England in the early 19th century following the war of the um, Chouanerie. I grew up in what I can only describe as a pan-Celtic family, the Irish, Breton, Welsh, Scottish aunts, uncles and cousins, to counterbalance the English ones. It was Padraig who encouraged me to go back to higher education and take my degree in Celtic studies. Now before we go further, and because of the misguided criticisms which have been made of the League over the years, let me explain what is meant by Celtic. In the Celtic League it is meant to describe one of six historic nationalities which spoke or speak a Celtic language into early historical time, modern times. That's simple. As Professor Jorn McNeill pointed out nearly a century ago, there is no such thing as a Celtic race any more than there is a Latin race, a Teutonic race, a Slavic race. We are all branches of the Indo-European linguistic family, so race is a delusion. The only accurate way to define Celtic is by language and its attendant culture. A Celt is simply one who speaks or is known to have spoken within the modern historical period a Celtic language. That is why the League has had consistently to reject overtures to recognise Galicia in northwestern Spain as a Celtic nation. There are more Celtic loan words in English and French than there are in Galician. Galician is a Romance language and closely related to Portuguese. It is not a Celtic language, and Celtic has not been spoken in Galician since the 10th century. 
1992, it fell to me to engage in a debate with the formidable Manuel Fraga Iribarne, who was the third president of the Junta de Galicia, the head of the Galician government, 1990 to 2005. Don Manuel was one of the writers of Spain's democratic constitution, which allowed Galicia self-government and recognition of its language within the Spanish Federation. In spite of reference to dialect words, folklore, themes, music, and so on, Don Manuel had to admit that Galicia failed the linguistic criteria. I stress this definition as a corrective to the attempts to denigrate the League and its membership over the years by people who do not know the difference between progressive anti-imperialistic nationalism and retrograde imperialist or racist nationalism. Racism is contrary to the League's philosophies. As a socialist involved in anti-imperialist and anti-racist movements and admirer of the works of James Connolly and John McLean, there was no contradiction in my journey. My pamphlet, The Creed of Celtic Revolution, 1969, expressed my views that I still adhere to and have been endorsed by any who have been following my writings since then. Looking back to the 1960s, it is amazing to consider the size of the mountain that the League was faced with. Of the six Celtic countries, Ireland was partitioned, and in northeastern Ulster, there was a regime which denied a third of its people civil rights, endorsing the suppression of any trace of the Irish language or culture. There was a law system in this so-called United Kingdom province, which, with the Special Powers Act, had been admired by Adolf Hitler, as well as the apartheid regime in South Africa. In 1963, Johannes Worcester, the Justice Minister, who later became President, said he willingly exchanged all his apartheid legislation for one clause of the Northern Ireland Special Powers Act. In the Republic, lip service was paid to the national language and culture, and as for economic independence, the popular saying in the 60s was that if somebody in Westminster sneezed, someone in the door blew their nose. The Isle of Man had self-government, but was more concerned with building up its offshore tax haven image than saving its language and culture. As regards Scotland and Wales, there seemed no likelihood for any form of self-government at that time, nor any real recognition of their national languages. In Wales, Camdaitis Ariat Camraid was just starting a campaign of civil disobedience to gain status for the national language. As for Cornwall, to suggest that it was an entity with any separate Celtic identity from England was to be regaled with scorn and laughter. Maiden Kerry, the Nationalist Party, was described in the Daily Telegraph as a bunch of dreamers waiting for King Arthur to arise from his slumber to lead them to Camelot. Brittany was suffering the worst. Since the Breton Parliament had been abolished in 1790, the French state had slowly but firmly set out to eliminate the Breton language and cultural identity. The Front for the Liberation of Brittany became active in the 60s, believing they had been left only physical force to progress the Breton cause. This, of course, brought greater repression to the country. So the League came into being at a time when the Celtic nations stood within sight of extinction as Celtic entities. Since 61, we have witnessed incredible changes in the cultural and political landscape, even from an international perspective. In November 65, the Celtic League submitted a 60-page memorandum to the United Nations. And today, the UN recognizes the League as a non-governmental organization. The decision to abandon plans for what was to be the first Welsh language daily newspaper due to a lack of funding was a blow for the Welsh media in general. With the funding cuts to Shadow Hitler Company announced last year and an agreement made with the BBC, the future quality and independence of Welsh language media seems even more uncertain. The adoption of the legislative competence order on the Welsh language by the Assembly earlier this year was met, which means now that the language may be even better protected than before. The creation of an independent Welsh language commissioner to defend the rights of users is another step forward. After progressing in the last decade and becoming a part of government, for the first time, Plaid Cymru suffered heavily in this year's election and now has a reduced representation. The 
subsequent announcement by Plaid's leader, Yeo Wynne Jones, that he intends to step down, uh, heralds a leadership contest, an issue which is too frequently used by the party since David Ewan's dare to use the word and won in 2003. The Manx Parliament did adopt over the years some few positive policies of Mesh Banner, but they too were reliant, too reliant on the financial sector. The 60s and 70s saw the nationalists McLannan and Full Hanu opposing the new resident policy and in the 80s uh, the campaign against the new financial sector uh, and, its effects on, and its effects on young Manx people led to an arson campaign with men being jailed. There was no sign on the part of the Manx government or Tinwald of any interest in extending autonomy to independence. The Manx government have allowed the language now to be taught in schools so that 2.2% of the population will certainly now have some knowledge of it. There is a Manx development, uh, language development officer and a small team of teachers. Manx can be taken as a subject at two second level schools and as a growing body of adult learners. A significant achievement in recent years is the start of Manx medium education at primary level with the founding of an Bunskol Eelbo, which now has 65 pupils. The Manx, Manx uh, nursery movement, Wurundjeri, is a success. There is now a recognition of civil rights in Northern Ireland. Uh, you can even speak Irish there and not expect to be, be beaten up uh, by members of the PSNI, although within the last year a young lady has been arrested for speaking, being heard to speak Irish in, in a public space. In 1961, we could not have predicted the marches of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Movement would have had such effects. With the reaction of the sectarian Northern State, Home Wells in 69, the rise of the Provisional IRA, Bloody Sunday, etc. These to be followed by almost 30 years' war, the H Block Dirty Protest and hunger strikes, leading to the development of the political struggle which culminated in the Good Friday and the St Andrews Agreements. Now, we have seen um, some continuing unionist and transients over a period of 10 years or so uh, in a functioning power-sharing uh, local assembly. Some cross-border bodies are, all, are operating, and as part of the process, uh, there was a referendum uh, which uh, opened up reunification of the country sometime in the future. Uh, the demographic shift towards it uh, is favouring the nationalist minority community. In the Republic, the economic development of the 60s uh, became the recession of the 80s, the benefits of the Celtic Tiger in the 90s were um, superseded as bankers, developers and politicians um, in the subsequent decade reached the present situation. The state is now effectively ruled by the Troika of the IME, the ECB and the EU Commission with the oil blue tax plan paying for the debts of the banks and developers and the following politicians. However, the policy of the Geldof is still precarious and though the Official Languages Act, the Office of Language Commissioner, official status for Irish in the EU, the success of TG4, the television station, and the newly announced 20-year language strategy, if it can be sufficiently funded, uh, and the expansion of Irish reading education uh, hold out prospects. In Cornwall, the national movement is no longer the butt of jokes. The UK government had to recognise the Cornish language in October 2003 uh, by signing the um, European Charter. Uh, this year, Andrew Stunnell, uh, Parliamentary Under Secretary, Department of Communities and Local Government, announced funding of a um, third of a million for the Cornish Language Partnership. In 1997, the UK Local Government Report had admitted that the continued existence of the Cornish Standard in Parliament encourages the belief has never legally uh, lost it and been incorporated into England. So we've seen a profound change of attitude there. Mayor McKenna has achieved election successes in town, and parish, and district councils, and four councillors on um, Consul Kerno. This is the nearest Cornwall has got to the Parliament. In 2001, a petition of 50,000 plus signatures was presented to Downing Street for a Cornish Assembly. 
language uh, has had its uh, ups and downs. And uh, it was through the skillful leadership and work of the MAGA uh, of this, uh, there's been uh, agreement uh, that uh, what we've seen is the uh, standard written form uh, adopted on the 30th of May 2008, uh, which holds out some prospects for the language. Later adopted by Porsche Kerno, an overwhelming majority, but despite these prospects, still major challenges for Paul ahead, not least in the plans to reform the parliamentary constituencies of Cornwall by creating cross-border constituencies <coughs> and the recognition of the Cornish as a national and European minority under the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. Brittany still suffers from the crushing centralism of the French state. We're all aware that the, the French constitution allows the recognition of no other language than French, but although France has tried to come to a more civilized position by giving some degree of recognition to national, uh, regional languages from 2008, uh, generally the situation remains difficult to live one's life through the Breton language as it was 50 years ago. Even so, bilingual science, D1 and D home schools, office art regionale, and other usages of the language are uncomfortable reminders to France that the claims of the Breton nation are not dead. Brittany is still partitioned despite the large demonstration in favour of unity and the desire of both the four Breton departments and Loire Atlantique to achieve it. While the UDB and Greens made a breakthrough in the last regional elections and there were signs of progress by new Breton parties, the overall level of support achieved was low. Changes have been happening and are continuing to happen, but there have been truly been, there has truly been a sea change. Has there truly been a sea change lately? I would argue that whilst the tide of what was once a sufficiently, a suffocatingly imperialism has changed direction. It has certainly not ebbed, and it's still lapping, unabated, around the shores of the Celtic Leagues. <coughs> so I argue that many of those who started on the journey with the Celtic League would be amazed at the changes. Amazed they might well be, but satisfied? Of course not. So whilst there's been a tidal shift, there's been no sea change. Since the League started its voyage, here in Scotland, whilst there is now a parliament in Edinburgh, and recognition of the Scottish Gaelic language, that language is still regarded by many as just a minority language for the Highlands, instead of recognising its true historic position as a national language. Little emphasis is given to educating Scottish people about the history of the language, that once Gaelic was spoken across all Scotland, language for monarchy, church and government. There was a mindset against admitting, even, that it was spoken in Galloway as late as the 18th century that even in Northumbria there are traces of the language. Its recession to the Highlands was a slow process. It is right that we're meeting here in Scotland to remind you of one of the Scottish pioneers of the League, the late Seamus MacGoy, whose research and pioneering articles should have left no doubt as to the historic position of the Scottish Gaelic language. In 1969, he inspired students at Glasgow University and helped to form Common Khan and Al Police, a more radical language movement. Seamus' strength lay in his historical researches, clarifying the history of the language, and I had the honour to co-author two books with Seamus, The Scottish Insurrection of 1820 and 1970, and The Problem of Language Revival in 1971. Incidentally, a book which is the biggest international um, language um, expert, Professor Joshua Fisher, who says, was his inspiration in uh, his formulating the theory and his writings on the concept of reversing language shift. Changes have been happening, therefore, and are continuing to happen. But has there truly been a sea change? I would agree that whilst the tide of what was once uh, the suffocating imperialism has ebbed, but uh, there are still prospects that can we still be satisfied? No, of course not. If you have the opportunity uh, to travel to uh, Glasgow, um, to Sighthill Cemetery, and pause before the monument of the 
severance of the Union with England. <coughs> that insurrection resulted in 80 trials for high treason, dire punishments, an insurrection that has been written out of Scottish history until our book was published in 1970, just beside the monument of, 19, of 1820. There is a smaller stone inscribed in Gaelic and English which commemorates the life of Seamus McAgoy, who died in 1987 and where his ashes were interred. Hopefully, you may still be able to get your hands on some of his essays. His papers were given to the Scottish branch of the League in 2000, and some of them were edited in a booklet, Scotland Not Only Free but Gaelic, published that year. Myself, author of etc. Um, contributed forward. What the common kind of eloquently achieved was, as Peter recalls me saying, was that it raised public awareness about the language and emboldened Gallic to demand and secure their rights and establish Gallic media and Gallic run initiatives in public life. But I know that Seamus would have been the first to declare that there was still a mountain to climb in changing Scottish attitudes. In view of the current debate in the League, one of the matters that the London branch agreed on in the 60s was that we needed, above all, uh, better communication. We needed a successor to an Emisha Heath job. And although there was an attempt to make a monthly magazine, the New Celt, um, this unfortunately foundered. And the late uh, Kenneth McMoyne, uh, native of Lewis, who taught London in the the Literary Institute um, had uh, attempted to get this one off the ground. Uh, finances came in from uh, many sources, some of them quite um, um, uh, significant, but um, with the needs to put money up front uh, for a whole of the year's publication in advance, uh, the uh, publication hit its difficulty.
successful you are, uh, the more there's likely to be criticism, which is why good communication is essential. In one of Peter's books, The Celtic Dawn, uh, still available from Alonda, he devoted a chapter to the philosophy and future developments of this movement. The League's main raison d'etre remains the principal aim to achieve cooperation between the six Celtic countries with their various forms of government in four out of the six nations. We should be seeing more inter-Celtic links on political, economic, as well as cultural platforms. We're often left to private uh, initiative rather than governmental level. But we ask ourselves why these links are not being put in place. Many of us, like sirens waiting in the dusk, point out the models of such as the Nordic Union as the road to progress. But we do not seem to have achieved any meaningful links between the leading politicians of those Celtic nations who have the ability to set in motion the paths towards such links. Consequently, a no see change in this respect. Clearly, the list of aims is that of developing consciousness of the special relationship and solidarity between the Celtic nations. This has uh, led to such initiatives as the UNESCO's project for the study and promotion of Celtic cultures, the Celtic film and television festivals, Skid Celt, the Celtic Languages Book Fair, another Celtic League initiative, uh, and the exhibition at the uh, Platz of Grassi in Venice in 1991, and the foundation of the London Association for Celtic Education was over its uh, time quite a powerful uh, lobbying and initiating group. But over the last decade we have seen an attack on the very concept of Celtic. We have seen uh, the likes of uh, television programmes which uh, tend to use Iron Age instead of Celtic uh, for our predecessing peoples. Professor Barry Rafferty who died last year as leading archaeologist and authority on this period, once humorously greeted Peter with the question, Hallelujah, Iron Age. <laughs> if I'd have been there, I'd have probably uh, rejoined with Sprachity Globish uh, as a retort. But um, very often now, instead of Celt, we find Iron Age, Iron Age folk as terminology replacing them. Um, The campaign started in 1996 uh, when a, a Sheffield University archaeologist, uh, John Collis, uh, showed dis dissatisfaction uh, on even using the term Celtic. And in the summer of 1997, Simon James <coughs> of the British Museum published his uh, book on the Atlantic Celts, um, in which he raised the point that whether it's reality or and the <coughs> debate uh, which ensued uh, was not always uh, treated particularly seriously, even on television, when a serious debate between Dr. James and, and Peter Ferris and Alice um, was um, sort of brought to almost ridicule by sort of bringing in all sorts of New Age druids uh, to muddy the waters. But as a historian, Peter says, I have to remind him of the words of Gaius Julius Caesar. Quid ipsorum linguae celtae nostra gale appellandum, which I don't need to translate to this audience as in their own language they are called Celts in our tongue Gauls. And of course, um, Peter could have thrown in Kendrick Jackson's groundbreaking 53 study of language and history in early Britain. So finally, Dr. James did admit that there were Celtic-speaking peoples. And indeed, following such um, luminous as uh, George Buchanan in the 16th century, and one can also add a hero of mine, Edward Stewart. And who was the, the Breton at this time, who also put forward this theory with Stewart of the um, modern Celts as the uh, linguistic descendants of the ancient Celts? There is um, abundant uh, historical work. Bill and Hamzy. Pardon? Bill and Hamzy. They just escaped me for the moment. However, these, um, if you like, attacks on um, the origins of the Celts and their reality today have been uh, carried on by the likes of Professor John Collis, uh, by the uh, work of uh, Tony Fryer, and others. 
two of the geneticists, Stephen Oppenheimer, uh, joining in the fun with his book, The Origin of the British uh, Genetic Detective Story, 2006, who demonstrated uh, there was no genetic difference between the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons, and therefore he too confirmed the Celts did not exist. Well, seeing that we have always used the linguistic criterion to identify Celts from other Indo-European linguistic branches, uh, the conclusion based on genes and DNA uh, should have come as no surprise to anyone. However, his arguments were spun um, to claim political points, and looking at his bibliography, we find our own friends Simon James, John Collins, <coughs> Francis Pryor, quoted at Norsea. Now, in conclusion, uh, Peter looks back at the political developments, uh, the linguistic and cultural developments. He looks at the developments in the academic debate uh, over the Celts, and he concludes, I make no apology for using this particular example to show you that in considering general attitudes towards the Celtic nations, there is still a mountain to climb and much work to be done. After 50 years, members who believe in the ideas and aspirations of those who came together to form this league cannot afford to sit back with any sense of self-satisfaction. A parliament in Scotland, yes, an assembly in Wales, yes, Degrees of recognition of the languages of both these nations, yes. Irish Republicans allowed to sit in Stormont and even say a few words of Irish, yes. The Dublin government thinking that all is well when the foreign heads of state and state visits after a few words in Irish, yes. Tinwald having finally allowed the Manx, Manx, Manx language to be taught in its schools, yes. And situations in Cornwall and Brittany, etc. Do we truly 